Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can come to thy house and uh, worship thee and, and come to Sunday school class and uh, learn more about thy word. And we pray for the people that's not here that couldn't make it or maybe sick or trapped and watch over them. And we thank you for the guests that we have here in our Sunday school class. And we pray for our pastor as we preach you, give him guidance and wisdom. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Um, every year, thank you. <laughs> Every year we hear the exhortation, uh, keep Christ in, in Christmas, which sounds kind of dumb that you have to, uh, you know, say that. So, but um, what do you do to keep Jesus in Christmas? What do you do? Anything? Okay, to pray. Um, Carmen, we've begun class. Okay, uh, so... You just go on and, and you pray. What else, Fred? Well, uh, when somebody uh, you know says, uh, you know, uh, happy holiday, I say it's Merry oh, Christmas. I make an effort too. Yeah, uh, store know. clerks, happy holidays, and I look right at them and I say Merry Christmas. And most of them look very happy that you've done yeah, that. Yeah, then they yeah. feel like they can say it, uh, you know, back to you. Other things that you do, Nancy. Well, I think the candlelight service is a wonderful thing. Okay, the can really, really thinking about this season of the year. I think the pastor's messages during this past month have been very appropriate. Always moving from the cradle to the cross. Um, I think that we get so wrapped up in what you know all of the outer things about Christmas that we forget that the purpose of his coming was ultimately to die on the cross for our sins um, we need to learn also and this is what we've been working at I think at our church the significance of Christmas is something more than the baby's birth a long time ago it was when God himself came among us for the purpose of reaching out so that we could spend eternity with him uh, in heaven and we'll just accept that that opportunity so knowing that we couldn't come to him that we couldn't earn our way to him that there's no way that we could come to him he came to earth to, to get us to save us and that's the beautiful thing um, why do you think this is such we get so caught up in Christmas that we forget the real purpose the real meaning of Christmas well, how do we let ourselves, we know all of this, everybody in this room knows all of this, but how, can, how do we allow ourselves, you know, I had to stop and wrap packages because I realized I was double buying, <laughs> oh, I've already got that person two things, you know, <laughs> um, and I got everything wrapped and all the Christmas cards and you get all, you know, move out of the way, that guy isn't paying fast enough. Why do we let ourselves get caught up in all of that every single year, Fred? And then uh, I think we all—it's big businesses that's got us thinking monetarily that we have to buy a gift for uh, somebody that's showing that we love them and stuff like. That. Okay, okay it, it used to be Thanksgiving was the, like I mean uh, Christmas was the day after Thanksgiving. Now it's uh, up in October they oh, started. Oh, you know, the Christmas trees popped out. You know, it's big business, and we're bombarded daily with the things that, that we need to do in order to prove our love. Right, the, the, over, the overpowering of commercials and everything else is not how much do you see of the commercials or things for Jesus for the meaning of Christmas. There isn't. You know, I watched last night streaming video <laughs> of my niece's, uh, my grandniece's Christmas uh, concert in Oil City, Pennsylvania. It was on the computer, and so I watched stream video. Every five minutes or so, they interrupted it. They kept singing, but they interrupted it with a commercial. It was amazing. I mean, it was streaming video, and I guess somebody had to pay for it, and that's the way that they paid for it. But every few minutes, they interrupted, you know, with some kind, uh, some kind of commercial. So we're totally bombarded. Howard, you had a comment. Oh, yes. I, 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 I learned the hard way. One year when we first, my wife and I first got married, we didn't have a whole lot of money at that time. So we both said, we're not getting each other anything for Christmas. Yeah. Nothing. Oh, dear. 
And so, okay, I took her for her work. I didn't even get her a Christmas card. Oh, oh you don't oh, do that. <laughs> you don't do that. I bet you smartened up in the last few years. I appreciate <laughs> Let's look at our, our lesson today is on looking at the real gift that, that we get at Christmas, the meaning of the gifts. You know, I've always thought about it as the three wise men, men brought gifts, and that's why we exchange gifts. That was a small part of it. It's God's gift, uh, and we've kind of contorted it and everything else that we have to outgive each other and we have to everything like this. So anyway, our lesson today is in Isaiah, looking forward, 700 years before he was born. God spoke through Isaiah to tell the people yeah, yeah. then that he was coming and to share with the people the message uh, that he was sending our Emmanuel. 700 years. And, and before the creation of the earth, God had his plan all yes. set, Amen. which is really amazing. So in Isaiah, we'll be looking at Jesus, our Emmanuel, was promised to us, promised to us. Matthew 1, we'll be looking at Jesus, our Emmanuel, saves us. And in the rest of Matthew 1, Jesus is God with us. These are the three uh, sections of our lesson today. So let's look at Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Um, and read that for us, please, Marge. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of <coughs> peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. All right. This, this past week, you know, as you're reading this and, re and remembering again that Isaiah, Isaiah wrote this over 700 years uh, before Jesus actually was born uh, physically here. And in the past week, we've seen terrible things happen. You know, you just, you just kind of think, what an evil time to live. What a terrible time to live when there's so much evil in the world. We saw those 26 people plus the shooter uh, dead, 20 of them babies, just 20 of them, you know, six and seven years old. We had a, a murder and a suicide at the Excalibur, at the reception desk, for heaven's sake, a hotel that supposedly is where people come for relaxation and fun and whatever, that there was a murder and a suicide. We watch, you know, I don't even watch the news anymore. I can't bring myself to watch the news anymore because it's, we see a Congress and a president who are more focused on winning than they are on what's good for us. And you know, I mean, and there's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that we can do about it. Um, we see uh, a gunman that opens fire in a crowded mall in Oregon. And yesterday there was a fellow out in the parking lot in a mall in California outside of Los Angeles that shot 52, 52 bullets into the air. No one was, you know, no one was hurt. Um, we see a football player who has money, who has made it in his goals to where he wants to be, the NFL, get drunk, drive drunk, have a wreck, and kill his best friend, who also was drunk from what uh, they say. So we might say, what terrible, terrible times that, that we live in, what terrible times that we live in. Um, it would seem that the world, just there's just so much evil here. But let's consider the times when Isaiah was writing. When Isaiah was writing, the northern kingdom, Israel had already been divided into the northern kingdom and Judah. And the northern kingdom had a partner with Syria, oh my goodness, Syria, had partnered with Syria to go against their joint enemy of Assyria. And they were demanding with penalties, with threats, that Judah join them. So what did Judah do? Judah went to Assyria and asked to join with them for protection. And you're thinking, can you imagine what the people were thinking that lived then? Their country was no longer a country, it was divided, and they were now each teamed with enemies in order to protect themselves against the other. 
Can you imagine? It would be, I was thinking, what would this be like in our country? It would be like the people east of the Mississippi had joined with China and were saying to the West, if you don't join us, there's going to be penalties, so we join with Russia. I mean, it's that kind of nonsensical thing, and you're thinking, oh my, oh my goodness. And so against uh, Isaiah's advice, and Isaiah told the king in Judah that this was not a good thing, they did join uh, with Assyria. So he warned that the king's decision would lead to disaster for Judah. He prophesied, though, that their destruction would not be complete. God always left a, a remnant. But that the nation's life would be threatened severely. And that God was the only refuge that the people had. And you know, that's, he's the only refuge that we have, that we have today. In spite of all of this around me, how can I have joy? How can we be smiling? How can the pastor come in here and ask us, what is, what is the time? And we sing, it's the best, it's most the wonderful time, time of the year. <laughs> oh my goodness, don't tell him I stumble about that. <laughs> but how can we have joy in our hearts? How can we want to hug everybody who's in here? You know, how can we feel that way? Because we've read the last chapter. We know where we are heading. We are just temporarily on this earth. God knew all of this would happen. Most of this we know was foretold in times. We know that the famines, we know that the wars, and we know that the earthquakes, we know that everything that's happening now was already known about. Our God is in control. Our God has a plan. And so therefore, in spite of everything that we see around us, we can have joy in our hearts and we can have peace and we can have someone that we can go to who knows all of my thoughts. Yeah. You know, I had, um, I have to tell you, I had to go for an MRI and it was in, um, in one of the tests there was something that was in, in um, that was, what do you call it, not normal. So I had to go for an MRI, not a pleasant experience. I didn't tell a soul. I didn't tell a soul because I don't like to be Hampered. <laughs> I don't like to be, you know, I don't like those kinds of things. So I didn't tell a soul except my God. And my God knows how quirky I am and he likes me anyway. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? He's the one that we can go to. He's the one that we know in spite of all of our shortcomings and in spite of whatever. If I am a believer, he is my father. And when he looks at me, he doesn't see this quirky person. He sees this, you know, the, not the anxious person that I am not. He sees me as his beloved daughter. He sees you as his beloved son. What a wonderful thing in a world that is involved in chaos that I have my island of peace in this world because I know the creator of his son, Jesus Christ. What a marvelous, wonderful thing. And it's more evident in these times than it is when everything, if everything ever did, go smoothly. So how blessed are we? How blessed are we, Hans? Just a comment, uh, one of our conversations that I had with uh, Pastor Brown in his office a long time ago. Mm -hmm. He made a comment about the revelations, mm -hmm. people, Christians, and all through. Uh, he said, most people who are afraid to read the revelations don't want to talk about it. We're not sure of their, of their uh, Christianity or being saved. Yeah. He said, if you're, if you're happy with that chapter, that book, he says, you know where you're going. Well, and, and we in general believe there are some, but we in general believe that we'll be out of here before all that comes Amen. to me. <laughs> and so, yeah, and the only thing that really is frightening about all of this is the people that we know and love who aren't saved. That's when all of this really, you know, where the rubber meets the road. And that's one of the things that I've been praying about. Make me more bold in sharing my witness. Help me not to care about, will this person write me off? <laughs> will this person, you know, all the things that we're concerned about that hold back our, our witness. And so we just really need to pray because end times are coming. I think most of us will see them. And that doesn't give us... That doesn't give us pause, except for those that we know and love who aren't and who aren't saved, because we know for a fact, not a hope for, but for a fact, that the second 
the nanosecond that we leave this earth, that we are in the presence of God. Amen. We are in the presence of God because that Jesus himself, out of his own mouth, told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say, you know, in two or three months or after you've done this and so, and after so many people have prayed for you or after whatever. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. And I think that that promise, you know, is for us too. And so we have nothing to fear. We just are concerned about those that we know and love who don't know the Lord. All right, so we know that these times are really bad, and, and um, Isaiah's painting this picture in the first part of Isaiah, of Isaiah, of his book, about what's going to happen because of what they've done. They say that it was like a thick darkness that was over the land, like a thick darkness. Now the prophet is trying to give them uh, hope to tell them what is coming, who is coming. And so we just had Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Jesus, our Emmanuel, was promised by God. This gives the people uh, some hope. But look how, he, look how he phrases this in verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born. When you look at the verb tense, what verb tense is being used there in that first line? present. He's speaking as if it happened. Yeah. Why is he writing that way? It, 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 he could have said, for unto us a child will be born. But he says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Why do you think Isaiah wrote as if it's happened? It's happening. It's happened. Why would he write like that? That's a good question. Because he had faith that he, he knew it was going to happen. When God says it, it's done. When God says it, it's done. That's the whole thing. That's what? That's the whole thing. When he says it, it's already done. Not our time, his time. Right. And so we can count on it as if it's happening right now. Because when God says it, it is already done. And Isaiah exhibits that wonderful faith by saying, unto us a child is born. Isaiah had no doubt. I'm sure that Isaiah probably didn't understand everything, but he knew that the message was from God. And if God says it, that ends it. You know, if God says it, that ends it. And that is the most wonderful thing about being a Christian. You know, if you, if you look, the rules kind of changed. When I was a teacher, I had to, if you start in year one, the catalog at your university is what you go by. Those classes required when you enter the university are the classes that will get you graduated. However, every year they tweak them. Every year they change. If you have to drop out a semester when you come back, guess what? Boom. You've got new requirements. Things change for a teacher. They keep changing the evaluation. They keep changing the rules. They keep changing in our faith in God. That doesn't happen. We can sing different songs. The pastor can bring us a different theme. We can have potlucks this day, and maybe next year we'll have them that day. Those are the extent of the changes in our faith. God, what he says, does not change. It's not, oh, I rethought that, and now that we're more mature, and now that there are more of us, now that, now that, now that, that, that doesn't happen. What he said in the beginning is what he says now. And he promised us, it tells us in his word, that he had this plan for me to spend eternity with him, all sketched out before he put the first thing in place in the creation. So he knew about how things would be. But he also knew that there would be, as I've said before, there would be a Marie and there would be a Ben and there would be a Beth. He also knew and he provided a way for us to spend the time with him. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Isn't that wonderful? And we should remember that all year long. All year long. You know, the Lord says he knows our needs before we do. And uh, when I was in construction, I got hurt. And I lost over 60% of my salary. You know, and I had 40% of this, and our needs are, and everything had happened to us. Everything was taken care of. You know, our, our bills, you know, we, we had enough to take care of our bills. Our food was taken care of. You know, we went to the right doctors. Everything was taken care of. I mean, it, it just, 
happen. But when you become a Christian, that don't mean you're not still going to have trouble. But it shows that God is with you and, and He helps you through it. You know. And and sometimes when we've got our mind set on something, God has something so much better Amen. than what we are going after. We can't realize that sometimes at the time we're going through it. The answer is no. <laughs> and we wonder about that, but God always has our well-being fitting, fitting within his plan in mind all these times. And I can't understand it, but I have to lean and trust in him. Amen. And, and the beauty is, I can't. I can't. He has never let me down. He has never, <coughs> ever let me down. All right. Um, so the... The child, he tells us here, the child is to be king, ruler, sovereign. The government is a kingdom of grace. They wanted relief. They wanted somebody to come in and get rid of the Romans. They wanted somebody to come in and get rid of the puppets. That's what they were looking for. Their whole focus was on that. And sometimes if we don't get our focus on the right things, we will miss out on the blessing. This morning, I did my ironing. It was, oh my goodness, I've got 30 extra minutes. I did ironing. And when I finished, I took the ironing board into my bedroom, and I thought, this is not where this belongs. <laughs> you know, we have to focus. <laughs> we have to focus on what we're working on. That's in our faith, we have to focus too, or we're caught up with the world, and we're caught up with the world if we don't. The four titles that he gives, the incoming or the Messiah, are what? Now, according to these verses, what are the titles that he gives uh, to, these, for, uh, to the Messiah who's coming in these verses? What does he call him? Wonderful Counselor. Counselor, would, he's saying, in effect, by saying Wonderful Counselor, he is saying that he is a source of wisdom. He is a source of wisdom, effective in planning, excellent in administration. Everything he does will be just and righteous. He is a wonderful counselor. And you say, how is he a wonderful counselor in my life? Is he a wonderful counselor in your life? How is he a wonderful counselor? Did he become a wonderful counselor? Can you think of ways that God is, that Jesus Christ is wonderful? You go to an ask for him and he gives you. God used to the answer. That you have a need, a concern, a, I don't even know what you call it, but you can take it to him, and even if you can't put it into words because it weighs so heavy, you can't even put it into words. He understands, and if you just stay quiet long enough and focus well enough, that he will guide you if he, if you uh, will allow him. You know, I, I look at... Um, Psalms 91, Psalms 91 and Habakkuk uh, chapter 3 verses 17 and beyond are my very, two of my very, very favorites and I always go to them when things don't seem to be going right and both of them talks about in 91 that he hideth me in the cleft of the rock and you know that he protects me um, with his wings, he protects me and in Habakkuk it talks about the fact that um, when I look around him, Habakkuk's talking, and he says when he looks around him, sometimes he can feel the bones inside his skin rotting because he is so scared. And so, you know, as he looks around him, but then he says, but I know the one in control. And therefore, I can rejoice because I know the one in control. That, that is a very, very special, uh, very, very special uh, section of scripture for me to say, in spite of what I see. In spite of what I feel, in spite of what my stomach tells me, I know the one in control, and I can rest in him. He is also, according to this, mighty God, all power, all power. He could have just come down off of that cross. He could have had angels come and rescue him. He could have just disappeared off of the cross, but he paid the entire price because if he had had angels come, we would not have, the sacrifice would not have been made. And we would have no way to have payment for our sins except for me to pay for them through eternity. And so he is mighty God, all powerful. But he's also the everlasting father in that that's the part I think that kept him going through what he went through, you know, as a loving father to make sure that you and I who accept the gift 
can, can be with him for eternity, can be with him for eternity. And Prince of Peace, can you imagine a war, I mean a world where there is no war? Can you imagine no rumors of war? No, can no you weapons. imagine no weapons? Can you imagine any of those things? But we have, we have the ability to have peace now. We have peace with God as soon as we are saved. As soon as we accept Jesus as our Savior, we have peace with God. But I have to allow the Holy Spirit to give me peace of God. I have, there's no doubt, I have peace with God. The minute I was saved, I have peace with God. But I can stir my little self up into a dither. I can do it faster than any of you. <laughs> Things happen and I can do them. Well, what if, what if, what if? You know, I mean, there was snow on the ground. What if my plane doesn't come? I've got an obligation Wednesday. I won't be able to meet it. What if there's ice on the, what, you know, whatever. What if I'm, what if I'm, what if I'm? And I can, there, there was just snow on the ground. And Minneapolis probably has had some of that. And they probably could take off in planes. <laughs> but we work ourselves into dithers, don't we? What if I forget somebody? Yesterday I went and bought four, in case I've forgotten, presents. Not for anybody specifically, but so that I won't be embarrassed if they give me something, you know? <laughs> and so we work ourselves into little dithers. We have, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I can have peace of God right here day to day. But I have to allow him to work in me. I have to focus upon him and his great gifts. It's not I can turn my button and now I have peace with, uh, of God. I have to be in his word and realize who he is and what he's done for me and therefore I can rest in his arms. These are, these are just wonderful things. What do these verses say to me today living in the world that we live in? Living in all of the, you know, all of the stuff that I listed at the beginning of class. What do these verses say to me living today in 2000, almost 13? Can you imagine? I remember back at the turn of the century, I took my last hot shower at 10 to 12. I was sure all of the systems would fail. And I needed to take my last hot shower before all the computers went berserk. <laughs> So it's going to be 2013, still had hot water this morning, didn't have to worry about it. What does it say? Oh, well, I was just going to say when you were talking about that, but the, uh, and the Mayan calendar is supposed to end on the 21st, so, yeah. you know, they, but I'm glad we're underneath a Gregorian calendar. You know. <laughs> the, the wonderful thing was I saw the Mayan calendar in yeah. the advertisement, it says Mayan calendar uh, says the end of the world on December uh, 21st, and then it showed an Oreo cookie that looks very much like. Luckily, we're under the Oreo calendar. <laughs> so, no fear, no fear. All right, what does it, what does, what does it mean, Hans? Well, today when we realize after reading and learning and everything that to have salvation is not difficult. Like we have to work for it every day, every day. Oh. And most people. I feel most people feel that they have to work for everything else and they have to work to get salvation. They cannot accept the, the, the ease of, of having salvation accepted. They, they won't accept something that's easy. Right, and we, we mentioned that and last sure. week when we were talking about, we always say to people, if it sounds too good to be true, okay. it is. That's why they stay away from it. And that's why people have that mindset, God's gift. All I have to do is acknowledge my sin, that I'm helpless without him, and that he's taken my place if I will just accept it. That's all I have to do. And I wonder, why didn't he give us 15, 15 steps? Why didn't he give us 15 steps or 12 steps or whatever it was? I wonder why he didn't, rather than, if there were any other way, he wouldn't have sent his son. Jesus wouldn't have gone through what he had to go through if there was any other way. But why did why do you think he didn't just say, well, here's Either or. Terry. Do you think the reason why is up until then they were tied down to rules? Okay. And he simplified it by these three these two verses here. The rules were given to us to be, as we talked about last week, a mirror into which we look and say, I can't keep it by the rules. I can't do it. We couldn't have done any one of those 12 steps in order to be good enough. There's no way. The Bible tells us that your 
My best efforts are as filthy rags when put next to the righteousness of God. There is no other way except his way. End of story. End of story. And we just have to accept that. Can, do I understand that? Can I sit down and write you up how that all works? No. <laughs> no. That's what faith is all about. He says it, that ends it. He says it, and that ends it. Let's look at the second scripture, uh, Matthew 1, 18-21. Jesus, our Emmanuel, saves us. Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In those days, um, marriage took place in three stages. First, the parents or the matchmakers uh, arranged for children to be uh, engaged when they were very, very young. So, you know, a, a child uh, in primary would already have the husband or wife uh, picked out for them. And then second, a year before the actual marriage, uh, they were said to be betrothed. <laughs> and in the betrothal, that lasted for about a year, and they were considered this time to, uh, during this time to be husband and wife, but they did not live together, and they did not come together during that time. But it was so serious that to get out of that, there had to be divorce papers, you know, divorce, uh, whatever. And then finally, in the, after that year, then there was the actual marriage where they became actual husband and wife. So Matthew tells this story from Joseph's point of view. That's interesting. I had I'd read this uh, many, many times as have you, but I never focused upon the fact that this was from his uh, viewpoint. What do you know about Joseph from reading these verses? What do you know about him? Lineage of David. Okay, lineage of David. But from this 18 through 21, what do we know about the man Joseph? <coughs> Her, the man Joseph, Joseph. I don't know if we know a lot. It doesn't tell a lot about him, but uh, he, he wasn't of a mind to have Mary killed. So what do you know about him? He loves Mary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, if he didn't love Mary, he would say, she needs to be punished for before he knew how she became pregnant, he said he might have said, but he didn't want her to be humiliated. He didn't want her to be shamed. So first of all, we know he really loved Mary. He really loved Mary. Um, and what else do we know? I think he was a uh, maybe a good man, a righteous man, and uh, we don't know for sure, but I, I believe that he believed in the Lord and in God. <coughs> now, why did he say that? Why would he say that he was a believer? Because uh, I think for one reason, if he if he was hot headed or just uh, action, he would say, "Well, no, I'm not marrying you. I'm, I'll, you know, she could be put to death, really, by at, at that." So we know that he loved Mary. We know that he was a just man. But when the angel spoke here in verse number twenty, he accepted. And in those days, dreams were considered to be you know, uh, messages from God. And so he thought, and the mess, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, telling him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you, marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And so he was a believer because this meant something to him that an angel of the Lord spoke to, uh, spoke to him. Resentment. That, that's a pretty pretty good uh, incentive, an incentive. And I didn't realize this part, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph announced that the name would be Jesus, that was the same thing as it totally accepting him, in effect adopting him. And so that, that was important uh, that 
uh, that Joseph uh, be the one to actually do that. Why do you think that, well, the angel told Joseph not to be afraid. Joseph, what did Joseph have to be afraid about? His honor. Honor! <laughs> His honor. What will the rest of the guys think? You know, I mean, that type of thing, the shame or whatever. And, and the angel of the Lord said, uh, you don't need to be afraid of any of that because you are part of a bigger plan. I think this Joseph was quite the man. I think he was uh, quite the man. Number one, he was quite the man because of what we just said. He loved Mary, and two, he was a just man, and three, he listened to the Lord, the Lord's angel. And um, fourth, I think that he was chosen by God to be the here on earth guide, you know, as, as for the young child. So I think that uh, he was, he was uh, quite a, a, a good man too. The angel further instructed Joseph that the son, that the child would be a son and that his name would be Jesus. And Jesus means Yahweh saves and Yahweh is salvation. That, and so the name is very significant. From what I understand, it wasn't an uncommon name then. And I think in um, in Hispanic world, it's still a name that is given to you know uh, to sons. So um, the angel goes on to say that Jesus would save his people from their sins. Now Joseph didn't ask the whys and the wherefores. I don't understand how that's going to happen. How can a child? You know all of these things. Joseph accepted. Joseph had um, faith. So here, the conclusion that we might draw is Jesus didn't come to earth merely to give us an example. That was an important thing. I think it's very important for us who are already believers to know that he was here so that we could learn more about the character of God and the love of God and how he deals you know, um, with people. I think that's very important, but the main purpose for why he came was to bring God's forgiveness. That is only possible through his sacrifice. <clears throat> Isn't that, isn't that amazing that God Almighty, creator of the universe, made a plan so that you and I could spend eternity? That is just amazing, still mind-boggling to me. Well, also, um, uh, God provides. God provides because Joseph would have <laughs> known had uh, God not revealed the situation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there would be no way for Joseph to know this. Mary might have told him, but that would not have been probably good enough, and so God himself, through his angel, told uh, told Joseph what this was about. All right, look in verse uh, verses 22 through 25 there in the first chapter of Matthew. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. All right. So he did exactly as he was uh, instructed by the angel of the Lord. What does verse number 22 confirm for you about how the Bible was written? Verse number 22 is, is really quite a verse. What does it tell us about it? It was already written, and those that have written it for at that time to write it was already um, spoken up to the Holy Spirit. Okay, it, it tells us here, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Yeah. Yeah. Through the prophet. So scripture is inspired by God himself. You say, you know, you, you hear people say, you don't want to tell a lie because then you have to remember lies and your lies compound your lies and whatever. And you look at the Bible. This part <coughs> is backed up by that part. This part foretells seven years before, 700 years. I mean, when Jesus came, could there be have been a setup <coughs> so that he would be born in Bethlehem? So that, you mean, all these things that were foretold in Scripture actually, actually uh, happened, actually happened. And so that was inspired by God, spoken by God through the prophets who wrote it down. I've told you that my mom used to 
um, she was given, I think, beautiful poems of faith by the Lord, and she would be out watering or whatever, and he would give her a poem. She, I've seen her throw down the hose and rush in, and it was like dictation. It was like dictation. And so they were beautiful and reached hearts. And so um, this tells us that God's word was written. It reaffirms that God's word is all inspired by God. All inspired by God. Pinned by different men, but all inspired by God. What is the difference does it make that the um, birth of Jesus fulfilled prophecies that God gave 700 more years before? What does that mean to you? Living in 2013, where we can just, I can watch a, a choir in Pennsylvania live, sitting in my little desk, watch them over streaming video. We live in, you know, we live in quite, a, we live in quite a, a wonderful time. I wanted to know, um, I was sitting at lunch uh, with some friends and the Broncos had played and I wanted to know the score because we weren't at a place where we could see TV. So I asked my phone, Siri, what's the score of the Bronco game? Well, the score is presently and then she showed me where they were on the, on the field. We live in a marvelous, in a mar it's, it's fabulous, it's fabulous. And so I, I remember typing everything. I did a thousand page dissertation by typing. <coughs> and every time I made a mistake, it was always on the last line and it was never fixable. <laughs> it took years to get that thing done. Now I notice that they even have speaking things that you can have this thing and as you're doing other things you can say, oh, da 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 da, and it goes on your grocery list or it goes in the book you're writing or it goes whatever. What does it mean to me, sophisticated me, sophisticated you, or learning to use all this stuff me, and learning to use all this stuff you, what does it mean that God's prophecies written a thousand years ago, 700 years ago, have happened? What does it mean to you that what he told about the last times, we're watching those unfold in front of us and around us? What does that mean to sophisticated you and me? It shall pass away. The rest of it will pass away. The rest of it will pass away. Uh, I mean, iPad 1s. Who has an iPad 1 now when they're iPads next generation? I mean, this stuff just goes and comes. The software companies, they don't support that anymore because they've got two new generations. They don't support that. It all passes away. The things that are important to us today, when David fell off that truck, and hurt his knee, probably the thing that was on his list next to do in their new house probably didn't become that important anymore because he had something that, you know, became more important. And so all this will pass away and the only thing that remains, the only thing that remains are things that God has told us and God has promised us. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that give you comfort? Doesn't that give you comfort? Well, God told us about all this stuff was going to happen anyway because he said in the latter days uh, knowledge will increase in, uh, in, in all sorts of time. You know, yeah. Everybody has an opportunity to hear the word. And the world I mean, will see it. And, and the world, they all will see it and they'll all know then, but they've got their chance now. Um, somebody asked me, they had visited in our class, they're not here today, but they visited in their class, in our class, and after class asked me, can a person be saved after they're dead? No. And what is the answer to that? No. no. Absolutely no. Absolutely no. You cannot make a decision after you are dead, no matter how many people pray for you, or how many candles are lit for you, or how many prayers are said for you. You cannot be saved after. And Jesus gave a parable that proved that. I mean, what was the parable? <coughs> Lazarus. Remember Lazarus and the rich man? And the rich man died and went to hell, and all he wanted was a just a finger with a little bit of water on the edge of his burning tongue. And he could there was nothing he could do. He knew, he knew the wrong that he had done. He knew that he was paying for that. And he asked that if they would just send, if God would just send somebody to tell his five brothers so they wouldn't end up like this. Somebody return from the dead and tell, oh boy, they'd really believe that. And the answer was absolutely not. They had the word of the prophets. 
They've had, you know, what God has said to them. They've had all kinds of opportunities to learn. The answer is absolutely not. Your chance goes right up until the time of death, and then it's over. It's like David with his son. When his son died, he, he washed, he cleaned up, because and he knew he could not do there anything. There was nothing that he could do uh, after that. What difference does it make in Matthew? It tells us that Jesus was born of a virgin. Why is that such an important fact in God's word? Purity. Purity. That he was born of the Holy Spirit. All of us who are born in the normal way, we, we arrive with the sin nature. Yeah. You can just look at little ones. I was over at uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah and Dan's house, and um, they, she is taking care of her little three-year-old, and now another little three-year-old, and she says, they do not want to share their toys. <laughs> they have arguments at three and at two about their toys. We are born with a sin nature. We are born selfish. We are born I, I, I. Jesus was not, because his father was the Holy Spirit himself. It was God himself. Okay, um, how can awareness of God being with us, God is with us, how does that give us confidence to do what God wants us to do? Joseph, when he heard what God wanted him to do, he, he did it. It says, so it was, uh, let's see, what does it say here? Um, then Joseph, in the verse 24, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. What do, uh, that gives me confidence. Why would it give me confidence to do what God wanted me to do, Nancy? Because he's with us through every trial. And I have to learn that. He's with me regardless. I have to learn that and rest in him. He still gives me choice. I can say, I'll do it on my own. Never mind. I'll do it on my own. Or I can rest in him and have the confidence to do what he wants me to do. Hans. He's waiting for you to ask for him. He's, he's waiting for me to ask. He will not force you know, force me to grow. He will not force me to read my Bible. He will not force me to lean on him. He gives me opportunities. But I have to make the decision. It's like the ironing board going into the bedroom instead of into the laundry room. I have to focus. Ray. He lives in you. And I have to realize, I mean, it's not that I have to say, oh, wow, I hope in another month I'll have another opportunity. He lives within me. He lives within me. The minute that I am saved, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside. The full Holy Spirit, not a little part of the Holy Spirit, the full Holy Spirit. I have to then open myself and allow him to work in me because he wants to grow me to be the kind of person he wants me to be. And all of us are still in the growing stage. Amen. And it's, isn't it amazing that he puts up, you know you better than anybody knows you, and you're thinking, he just is so loving, you know, so loving. You think, I'll never get anxious again. I'll not be impatient again. I'm going to be loving. I'm not going to be self-centered. I'm not going to be, and with his help, you know, I can grow in those areas, but I have to work with him in doing that. I have to focus on the on those things. It, this this being a Christian, just like this old agehood, is not all it's cracked up. I mean, the old agehood is not all it's cracked up. The being a Christian takes me yielding, yielding more of my life to the Holy Spirit and focusing on who He is and just remembering also who I am and that God knows everything about me and still loves me and still loves me and wants me to grow and mature and to be his true instrument here on earth. What a wonderful thing, what a wonderful gift we have at Christmas, the knowledge that I have been saved by the blood of the, of the Holy One myself. Amen. I have been saved. I am covered by the blood. When God Almighty looks on this evil earth, he sees us as his instruments, as his blood-bought children. We're just, as, we're just as connected as Joseph was. We're, we're just as connected as Joseph was. God does not change. God does not change. And, and that is a joy and a blessing to know that. 
Let's close with a word of prayer, and we may even get out on time today. <laughs> um, Kurt, would you lead us, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you that you love us and that you have promised to keep us. We pray that you will help us to be yielded completely to you and to allow you to work in our lives. So we thank you again for this lesson in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.